the second video in my series, Flip the Switch, and today I'm going to be talking about psilocybin and LSD. I do want to begin by stating that I do not support or condone the use of illegal or illicit drugs. I decided to combine psilocybin and LSD in the same video because they share a very similar uh, timeline as far as science and medicine are concerned. And um, that being said, LSD is a synthetic component and psilocybin is the psycho, uh, psychedelic chemical in, in specific mushroom species and that is found in nature. So mushroom or psychedelic mushrooms have been around thousands and thousands of years. There's um, cave etchings that date back over 10,000 years ago in southeastern Algeria depicting their use for um, spiritual ritual. Also Roman, Greek, and Egyptian cultures also used artwork depicting the use of mushrooms in ceremony and Mayan and Aztec cultures as well. Aztecs uh, use the term Teo Nanakatl or flesh of the gods because they believed if you ingested these mushroom these mushrooms that you would um, be one with God. And so in the late 1500s, actually, the Catholic Church banned the use of these mushrooms be because they um, knew that they were using them as a sacrament to God and that interfered with their teachings. Um, but there was still plenty of documentation about the these mushrooms being used, and that piqued the interest of a man by the name of R. Gordon Wasson, who at the time was also a v he was a VP at Chase Bank and also an amateur mycologist. Um, he made many treks down to Mexico to find these mushrooms, and it wasn't until 1951 where he went down with his wife um, to the Oaxacan region in Mexico, where he was introduced to a corndero by the name of Maria Sabina. Uh, corndero, corndero also means healer, and she she decided that she would share these mushrooms um, with Wasson and his wife, and they had a transcendental psychedelic experience, and that was just the beginning of many more trips that Wasson had taken down to Mexico to study these mushrooms. Um, he brought on part of his team was Roger Heim, who did all of the uh, artistry and uh, drawings of, of these mushroom species and also uh, named the Salasabe Mexicana and it was that strain that was shared with Sandoz Pharmaceuticals and um, Sandoz Pharmaceuticals was based in Switzerland and in 1938 they were uh, a chemist by the name of Dr. Albert Hoffman was studying uh, LSD 25 or lysergic acid um, diethyl amide and they uh, took an ergo, ergo fungus which uh, LSD was a chemical derivative off that fungus and that fungus had history of medical use um, hundreds of years prior in childbirth to help with uterine bleeding um, but when they were working with the substance they were looking for a circulatory and rep respiratory stimulant and also uh, also involving childbirth but they realized that there was other chemicals that were working better and so they decided to shelf it and then April uh, April 16th 1943 after having some epiphany or dream Dr. Hoffman decided to bring back LSD 25 and um, had gotten some of it on his hands and had a his first hallucinogenic experience and once he figured out what was going on and what had happened and actually had a positive um, uh, feeling after taking it he decided to uh, self uh, self medicate with uh, 250 micrograms of LSD three days later on April 19th 1943 um, which is also a bicycle day and I'll let you do your research on that but it was because he uh, had was had a psychedelic trip and went on his bicycle on this little journey and adventure. Anyway, I diverge. So um, Sandoz had been experimenting with this LSD twenty five, and at and then in the fifties, um, Roger Heim had brought this psychedelic mushroom to the lab, and um, Dr. Hoffman isolated psilocybin and psilocin from this mushroom and then they actually made a synthetic um, a synthetic psilocybin component called indocybin 
And so they used both LSD and uh, endocybin, in, and they allowed um, scientists and psychiatrists to apply and get samples of these uh, chemicals to use in their studies. And over like a 12 to 13 year period, around 40,000 different participants uh, were able to use these chemical components and had great openings and uh, great findings with uh, as an antidepressant and in the use of addiction with alcoholism. And um, it was during this time that in 1957 that R. Gordon Wasson and Roger Heim gave their information to Life Magazine and Life Magazine uh, came out with a story about magic mushrooms bringing the attention to the masses and one and it caught the attention of a, a psychology a psychology professor and psychologist um, Timothy Leary who was at Harvard he had a transcendental experience with these said mushrooms um, in Mexico and then also had known that Sandoz Pharmaceuticals was allowing um, samples of this to be uh, purchased for use in the studies that different scientists were conducting. And so him and um, Al um, him and Richard Alpert, or as we know him today as Ram Das, were conducting a series of experiments at Harvard called the Harvard Psilocybin Experiment. And there was a series of different experiments going on. Uh, one of them involved prison inmates to help um, with their reincurrence of incarceration or the activities, their illegal activities that were causing them to be incarcerated. And they were also using them in other experiments um, with different um, students. But then they became a little looser and they were giving a lot of these substances to students um, and then selling them. And in 1963, they both were asked to leave Harvard. Um, so Timothy... Leary was a huge um, part of the counterculture that in the 60s that was, you know, going against the grain of um, typical society at the time. And uh, psychedelics started to reach, you know, more mainstream use. And um, there were young men that were having these great awakenings and deciding that they didn't want to go to war around the time of the Vietnam War and they were do dodging the draft. So Richard Nixon, uh, around 1968, made these psychedelics illegal and uh, classified them as Schedule One drugs, where they remained in untouched and um, kind of ostracized for many years. And then in the late 1900s, excuse me, in, in, late, in 1999, there was some funding uh, private funding to um, John Hopkins to use um, uh, psilocybin and then uh, Roland Griffiths who was also very well known for his studies with addiction um, had a few different studies take place um, after 1999 and also in 2006 um, using psilocybin to help um, with uh, alcoholism and so that gives you a little bit of history and um, where we're at today is so in Oregon it's on the Oregon ballot this year to um, make the use of psychedelics legal for uh, medical and therapeutic purposes and then psilocybin is decriminalized in Oakland, Santa Cruz and Denver and that means that you can use, you can grow your own, you can use your own, you cannot sell, and you cannot practice with these uh, substances. So, uh, psilocybin and LSD chemically are very similar and act in a similar way in the body. Um, they both act on the serotonin receptor called 5-HT2A, as well as some other serotonin receptors, but this is the main one that they um, work on. And psilocybin is the inactive uh, component and is the is a pro drug to psilocin and psilocin is the actual chemical compound that um, causes the um, psychedelic experience. So you know hallucinogens um, disrupt these serotonin pathways and make changes to cellular signaling and function and alters your sensory and in, in sensory info alters your consciousness and also de decreases and diminishes activity in certain areas of your brain and your um, medial prefrontal 
prefrontal cortex or your singular cortex or PCC. And there's this area that's called the um, default mode network. And actually, um, Michael Pollan talks about this in his last chapter of his book, um, How to Change Your Mind. And I highly recommend that book. But I also uh, found that section fascinating. Um, so the default mode network um, is associated associates with uh, introspective and internal thoughts and um, so psychedelic drugs alters your human awareness and perception and this area of the brain um, plays a big part of um, in depression it's very active in depression and in, and it's very active in anxiety and psychedelics diminish this so that your sense of health, self is diminished means your ego is diminished and more healing work can be done um, and also, um, just so I can say that meditation also um, decreases activity in the default mode network. So meditation, if done daily and for a long period of time, can elicit the same effects as psychedelics. Um, psychedelics are basically just a shortcut um, for some of this work, but also um, have long-term positive effects, just like meditation does. Um, so... I just wanted to touch in on dosing as far as, um, I'm going to talk about microdosing. If you want to get a little bit more in depth with dosing, dosing there's plenty of information out there that you can research. Um, and I wanted to touch on microdosing for a few reasons. Uh, the increase it, you, microdosing or taking small amounts of either LSD or psilocybin can have huge benefits in um, your overall well-being, your creativity, increased focus, um, it can help with depression, it can help wean off antidepressants, it can even help women with PMS symptoms. So um, th there's two uh, methods to microdosing and James Fadiman, also the author of the um, Psychedelic Explorer's Guide and Paul Stamets, who is the founder of Fungi Perfecte, have two different methods. James Fadiman's is you take your microdose, which um, for psilocybin it's 0.1 gram to 0 0.25 gram um, once every three days for a month. And then Paul Stamets states to take your microdose w once every day for five days and then off for two days. He also has a, the, the Paul Stamets stack, which includes an adaptogenic mushroom called lion's mane and niacin. And um, there's plenty of information out there about that. But just know if you do the stack, um, niacin is, uh, it can cause flushing and can be uncomfortable for some people. So um, do your homework. Also, I, you know, utilize these, uh, if there's a clinical trial going on, or if you decide to take any um, of these psychedelic um drugs, then please do so uh, under um, having somebody with you that is not taking the medicine, especially if you're taking a high dose, just in case, you know, to, to, to help prevent you from having a bad trip or a bad experience that can help redirect you if you get caught up in any negative thought loops, have increased anxiety or panic attack, which um, some basic tips for that is is movement, It'd get up and move and walk around, or if you're moving, sit down. Um, if you take too much of a substance, you can also eat something and that can help. Um, also decrease in, decreasing your environmental stimulus like music, either turn it up, turn it down, change it, turn it off. Um, and then deep breathing is also very, very helpful. So a micro dose of LSD is considered five to 15 micrograms. So micrograms is a much smaller quantity than like milligram or gram. And so um, LSD is a much more concentrated substance. So be very cautious um, as far as dosing is concerned. Also using testing kits that are available that I believe Third Wave has a testing kit um, that you can purchase. I think it's like $45 or something like that. But there's other ones out there. But I just highly recommend if you are going to take these journeys to just be safe and know, what, know where you're getting um, these chemicals from. And to do so uh, responsibly and uh, elicit the use of somebody that's trained professional, especially if you're using these for therapeutic um, for therapeutic purposes. Um, and I just also wanted to say that 
there you can build a tolerance with both psilocybin or LSD and tolerance is if you continue to take this chemical it's not going to have the same effect and also it's going to decrease those serotonin receptors those 5-HT2A receptors so then it's also the reason why it doesn't work as well and there's a cross tolerance meaning like if you develop a tolerance to uh, LSD then you also in turn develop a tolerance to psilocybin and vice versa so just know that and then as far as dosing um, on any individual trip you have some you have your on you have your onset your peak your and then post peak and then your which is your come down so your peak is usually around like the two to three hour mark um onsets use anywhere between 30 minutes to an hour um so your peak is the most intense part of that hallucinogenic trip and you can never get that intensity at that time again you can redose to prolong the um you can redose to prolong like a post peak for two to four hours but you can't um you can't duplicate that peak experience. So just know that as well. I just thought that was inf interesting information that I wanted to share. So um, that being said, um, psilocybin gives an, anti, uh, an antidepressant effect and also it can help quiet the ego or quiet the sense of self, which is really important um, when you're doing any kind of healing work, especially around trauma. So trauma is... Um, stored energy in your brain and in your tissues in, on a cellular level and when trauma occurs in, in the body it's a protective mechanism to suppress this tra trauma and then that suppressed trauma leads can lead to depression anxiety ptsd and addiction and um use, utilizing these psychedelics can really help open you up to quiet the ego and open yourself up so that you can start to process this this trauma and get it out of your body and out of your system so it's no longer weighing you down or causing these um, these depressant or addictive effects on you. Um, so psychedelics like psilocybin and LSD bring your chemical processes back into balance and create this uh, heart opening, self uh, acceptance and love and a transcendent experience it can also help um it can even help people be more extroverted and um, trusting of others and trusting of yourself and you know there's these are all wonderful things to help in healing and um, mitigate the use of pharmaceuticals because pharmaceuticals yes they can help at some at some for some things but they're also band-aids and they're not really getting to the source of the problem um, and you know with what's going on in the world today there is you know a lot happening out and of course we all want good changes to come and the first step is to do the work and change yourself so if you want to change the world you got to start with yourself um and i just also want to let you know that there are a multitude of clinical trials and studies going on um with um uh, organizations like MAPS uh, and you can visit their website maps.org and MAPS is Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Study. Also uh, Compass, Compass Pathways is another as well as Imperial Center for Psychedelic Research and then John Hopkins also has a psychedelic research center and you can visit clinical um, clinicaltrials.gov and that will list the clinical trials going on or that are open for enrollment in the US, Europe and Brazil. Um, I really hope you found this information informative and helpful. Um, feel free to reach out to me if you have any further questions and I can help guide you in any way that I can. And if I can't, I will get someone that can and get you the correct information. And um, yeah, I hope you enjoyed it and be well.